Okay, we're going to, Mrs. Huerta, we're going to um, move to city manager's comments, update on city operations. Uh, Mrs. Rose. Yes, Mayor and Council, we will be um, talking about the animal care performance report. Todd Green, Commander, uh, Police Department, also a uh, Supervisor of Animal Control Services. Mayor, Council Members, thank you for the opportunity today to present our uh, Animal Care Services City Performance Report. Um, as all other departments, uh, the City Performance Report can be found on the City webpage. Our, uh, our department is uh, the first on the, uh, on the drop-down list, so we're easy to find. Um, our, uh, our city performance report, like, uh, like the other departments, is based on the Animal Control Services uh, uh, business plan. It provides uh, for transparency and accountability for our department. Anyone can access this information, review it. And it also gives us a measurement towards our success or failure in uh, our stated goals. Um, the um, City performance report is broken down into three sections. Uh, the operational profile for animal care services um, is up in the upper right corner and basically uh, speaks to the fact that um, the animal care services became part of the police department in 2012. It also talks about the days that uh, the animal care services shelter is open to the public, which is six days a week from um, 10 p.m. 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. for registrations, and then 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. for uh, adoptions, uh, drop, uh, people dropping off their animals, and so on. Uh, we also have field services, which is a big part of what we do, uh, and that particular part of our uh, operation is a seven-day-a-week, 18-hour-a-day operation. Uh, we, we answer calls uh, during that time period, and then we're also available for emergencies for the remaining uh, uh, eight hours per, uh, per day. Uh, over here on the baseline information, uh, it speaks to the number of employees we have and uh, our budget uh, numbers and things like that. One thing I would like to point out is right here, um, uh, the number of um, animal control officers budgeted. If you look at the baseline information, it appears that we had a tremendous increase in the number of animal control officers from 2011-12 to 12-13. And actually what that also reflects is the fact that we uh, merged vector control into animal control and we also merged positions within uh, animal care services at that time period. And that was about the time that we transitioned from the health department over to the police department. So in fact, it wasn't a, a dramatic, such a dramatic increase. Those numbers actually included uh, five vector control personnel, which is now all part of the same operation. Um, going uh, further, uh, we, we currently have approximately uh, 14 officers for field services. Uh, those are the officers that go out into the community, pick up the animals, impound the animals, write citations, and so on. Um, our department mission, of course, is to administer animal uh, regulations and promote responsible pet ownership throughout the community. And then, uh, of course, uh, below that are our mission elements. Which include administer administering code compliance, picking up stray animals, caring for the in, car, in custody animals, which is a huge part of our operation that a lot of times people uh, don't see. We actually have to care for those animals once we have them in our custody, uh, promoting adoptions and pet ownership, controlling the stray population, and reducing vector-borne diseases. And uh, under uh, administrating code, we, we measure that by the number of citations that we issue. Uh, that is a part of our our job, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't necessarily uh, 
like to issue citations, but it's something we have to do to gain compliance in many, uh, many uh, circumstances. Uh, picking up strays is a huge part of uh, what, the, what the officers do. Um, you can see that uh, just in this fiscal year, we've already, uh, uh, we've already received over 9,000 stray dog complaints alone. And out of those numbers, we've impounded almost 2,000. And that is just those dogs that we would, uh, that the control officers would impound would be the ones where we haven't been able to identify an owner. Um, we, if, we, if we're able to go out and identify the owner, we return that animal to the uh, owner and then, of course, uh, cite them if it's appropriate. Uh, caring for our in-custody animals, uh, our number of live release uh, from the shelter, that's our dogs, cats, and other domesticated animals. Uh, we, we just caught this morning that we had actually been counting wildlife in that number. Uh, we made the correction in this fiscal year and we are going back to correct previous fiscal years. 12-13, uh, we were about 2,400 uh, live release. Uh, our, our adoption numbers has been a huge uh, emphasis, uh, increasing our adoptions. If you notice, we have a target uh, of 700. For this fiscal year, we've already uh, far succeeded that number, over doubled it uh, already, and that has a large part to do with uh, the emphasis on adoptions and our uh, work with the local rescue groups and, uh, and whatnot, volunteer groups, uh, has been a huge impact in that area. Uh, controlling our strays, uh, the number we're using to measure that is our, uh, our number of sterilizations that our shelter vet does, performs, and that's pretty consistent and uh, we're, we're almost maxed out on that number, the number that we can do each year. And we're looking for ways to try to increase that number we would rather uh, sterilize the animals so that we don't have to be out there constantly picking up uh, un unowned stray animals. So that's the strategy there. And then last not, but not least is uh, our vector numbers. We measure the number of positive West Nile tests of our traps. That's not uh, actual uh, people that have contracted it. It's the number of tests, our traps that have tested positive or mosquitoes that have tested positive. Last year we had none and that's certainly our goal. Uh, we are revising our strategy and the way we approach that a little bit this year, and we're hoping to continue uh, with uh, very low or no numbers in that area. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you. If you any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you, Commander Green. Mrs. McIntyre? Th thank you, Commander Green. Uh, I appreciate this report. I know animal control has, has, has uh, under the police department really has made some tremendous strides and in, in improvement and you, you can sense that in the response that you get from community members. I know a couple of neighborhoods that have had problems with stray dogs that you guys have worked very successfully with uh, and I, I appreciate seeing that. Um, ve vector control is one of those challenges that we, we also have a lot when, when there's a lot of rain and uh, un unfortunately we either have a choice between water or mosquito, you know, <laughs> drought or mosquitoes are one of those things. Um, can, can you uh, address for, for residents uh, the ability for them to search out uh, the vector control spray schedules and some of those other things and of, of either reporting that when that happens or their ability to see when it's sprayed or, or those times that you can't spray, whether it's wind or rain or things like that, because when that does happen, uh, those, those are a lot of complaints that we get when, when there are a lot of mosquitoes. And also if you could look at on the on the, the dashboard if there's some, some other uh, statistics that might also be useful for people to recognize the work that you are doing for vector control when we do have those, those uh, a lot of, a high quantity of mosquitoes in the area. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the compliment. There's a lot of very hardworking employees out there that take pride in what they're doing and they do the very best with what they have and, uh, and I'm very proud of the work that they're doing. Uh, as far as the mosquitoes, uh, we do post that on our, there's a link on our webpage, uh, the Animal Care Services webpage. The spraying is based on the number of uh, mosquitoes that are trapped. So we don't routinely spray and that's probably one of the things that uh, the people in the neighborhoods that are confused about. Uh, they call in and they're wanting to know when we spray, kind of like uh, uh, trash pickup or heavy brush pickup. I think they assume there's a, a standard schedule 
And actually what it is, is it's based either on if we get a positive West Nile test, we will spray that surrounding area. Or if we uh, go over a particular threshold of the number of mosquitoes caught in the trap, granted that's, you know, the traps are spread out through the city. Um, it's time consuming for the three vector personnel to go out and test. Uh, but that's the way that's based on. And when, when they do reach that threshold, then we'll begin spraying. This year, we've, uh, we've trained some uh, more of the animal control side. We've trained them to perform vector services, so we're going to try to have more people out there when, when we get the influx. And we're also encouraging education. You know, we're, it really uh, helps uh, for the community to identify sources of mosquito, uh, mosquito breeding, basically. Uh, standing water is the number one thing, asking the, the people to dump out standing water. The rain, I mean, we love the rain. Uh, we've been begging for it, but when we get it, we need to get rid of those standing sources. Uh, we're going to be doing more of the preventative, the larviciding this year. When we spray, people need to understand that spray only kills the mosquitoes that are airborne at that time. So uh, it's only going to kill the mosquitoes that are flying on the street when the, when the control officers go by. Uh, it's not uh, as effective as, as a lot of people probably believe it is. Or, and I did at one time too. I thought it was you know, like, so, like off or something that would keep them away. So it only kills those mosquitoes. It, it, we, it, the estimate is maybe one third of all the mosquitoes it, it, it'll kill that are airborne at that time. Uh, so we're looking for other ways and certainly larviciding and, and educating the public is gonna be a big part of that. Hope that answered your questions. It did, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. McGill. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commander Green. I've got a compliment and a question. Compliment is when you look at uh, promoting pet adoption and pet ownership, when we look at um, fiscal year 13, 14, you've got 1,603, like you said, is more than double what your target is. Mm -hmm. You look at 12, 13, you're at 1,577. If we hop back one more year, you had 430 in 2011. 2012 so it's a marked difference it's a, it's a huge amount of pet adoption and ownership that you've increased so that's my compliment to you and all of the staff and everybody who work really hard to make that happen uh, my Thank question you. is and this was good timing because I got a, a, a call or a message late Saturday night about a large dog in the backyard of a homeowner and um, they didn't know exactly who to call they called the non-emergency line um, and they got kind of put back a little bit because there were more emerging or more, more important calls to take. And so I got the message about 8.45 in the evening. Um, within about an hour and a half, that dog or animal care did show up. Um, by that time, the dog was actually in the garage of the homeowner. And I have to give special kudos to the homeowner and his wife because they're both nurses. And they decided they could have very easily opened the garage door and let the dog loose. It was aggressive towards their dog, but they chose not to, you know, have that dog go out and be somebody else's problem. So my question is, when something like that occurs, and I know that's not that's an exception to the rule, what is the best contact point or the best way for a citizen to call in and get a better response time? That uh, calling the police department uh, non-emergency line is the best way. Um, during the daytime, all the calls for service for animal control services and vector comes through the city hall call center. But after hours and on the weekends, all our calls are routed through police department dispatch. And generally at that time on a weekend, we, we probably only have one or two field officers in the field and they're going to prioritize by, you know, emergencies. And that's primarily what they're, what they're prioritizing on bites, uh, very aggressive animals, uh, those, those types of in injured animals, animals that have been hit by cars, things like that. So that's really the best way. And unfortunately, uh, uh, with only two officers to cover the entire city, the, the response time may be slow. We're going to prioritize the emergencies. Okay. Um, that would be considered a confined animal. That would be a higher priority for us. Okay. And, and that I see with your mission elements, um, and your goal, it says perform timely, courteous, and professional responses to service requests. Um, if there are ways or if there's a way that I could be of service or help, please let me know because, I mean, that's the better response time. I mean, obviously, you don't want a bite to occur, but you also don't want to, 
I mean, with limited resources, you don't want to push people back so far that a bite does occur. So, Absolutely. Um, and, we're, and we're working towards that. We're doing everything we can to try to improve that. Um, whatever, whatever it is that we can do within our budget and our resources. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. You're welcome. Commander Green, um, also, in addition to your outreach and partnership, we would not have been able to accomplish those adoptions if we didn't have people assisting animal control and other many, many volunteers that have partnered up with the animal control. But since it has been, I, I'm so glad that uh, Councilwoman McIntyre brought it up that since it's been under the police department and the new leadership that has been put into place, it has gone through a 180. And it's a total different department and it's something that Yes, we have improvements to make, but I will tell you, it has gone leaps and bounds. It's a whole different culture and also the outreach of partnerships. And I say congratulations and keep up the great work. Thank you, Mayor. I will pass it on to the people that are out there working. They're very, they are very dedicated people. Uh, unlike some of the things that, that you may hear, they love animals. They're animal lovers and they want to do everything they can to, to save as many animals as possible. And you're absolutely right. Without the help of the, the rescue groups, the volunteer groups, we would have never been able to uh, push the numbers to where we are uh, now. And then, of course, the hard work of the, the people there at Animal Care Services. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for your leadership. Good report. Mrs. Rose? Yes, Mayor and Council, there's one other announcement we would like to make as it relates to the planned Corpus Christi project that staff is working on. This week starts the beginning of a public meetings where we're asking the public for input on developing a new comprehensive plan called Plan CC 2035. The city is hosting local workshops this week and again in a couple of weeks in conjunction with our comprehensive plan. As you can see as listed, um, there is a slide that talks about the, the meetings in the different districts. We will follow up with the citywide forum on Saturday, June 28th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the American Bank Center. After the series of public meetings, the planning team will develop a shared vision for the city and identify priorities based on the input received. And you can get more information on www.plancc2035.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rose. Anything else? That's it, thank you.